Uh, good evening. My name is Barry Logan. I'm the current president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this evening's webinar in a series of uh, career uh, development webinars that uh, the AEFS is offering for the first time this year. Uh, this initiative is in support of uh, the theme for uh, this year uh, as uh, my year's president, which is on forensic science education and mentorship. And our upcoming uh, annual meeting, uh, which will be held in Seattle, uh, February 17th to the 22nd of next year, um, is focusing on uh, recognizing the uh, uh, people who are coming up through our, our profession, people who are entering the field, uh, and want some information about uh, how to be best qualified uh, to find uh, good and exciting jobs in the field and how to develop their careers once they uh, actually are hired and uh, start practicing as forensic scientists. The AFS is uh, uh, the largest uh, professional forensic science organization in the United States. We have approximately 7,000 members. And uh, each year at our annual meeting, we have around 4,000 uh, attendees or delegates at the meeting. Uh, this, the, the organization is comprised of 11 sections that covers everything from criminalistics to toxicology, pathology, biology, physical anthropology, uh, and uh, several others, including uh, this evening's uh, specialty, which is forensic odontology. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you two representatives from uh, the odontology section. Uh, the first is uh, Dr. Robert Barsley. Uh, Bob Barsley is the immediate past president of uh, AFS, uh, and uh, together with Dr. Adam Freeman, uh, they're going to give a presentation this evening telling you something about the field of forensic odontology uh, and uh, ways in which you can uh, become uh, involved in that field, learn more about it, and uh, eventually become a practitioner of forensic odontology. Um, Jeff, do you have any introductory remarks on the format or the questions? Yeah, uh, well, thank you uh, very much for joining us tonight. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Adam and uh, Bob will start a PowerPoint presentation and give you some uh, basic information. And feel free to submit your questions via the chat box uh, in the GoToWebinar control panel. And uh, those will be received and will open up for Q&A after their main presentation has, op uh, has finished. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bob and Adam. Thank you also. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Barsley and I spoke earlier, and uh, Dr. Barsley is uh, eminently more qualified to give this presentation than I am, uh, but he's allowed me to do it. So thank you, Dr. Barsley, and welcome all of you. Uh, I welcome you from freezing cold Connecticut, while Dr. Barsley is sitting in New Orleans where it's nice and warm, and I am completely jealous. So we'll, we will get going here. Uh, forensic odontology is essentially, some people will call it forensic dentistry. So, uh, so, now my, so you know who I am. Uh, I teach at uh, Columbia University uh, in New York City. Uh, the campus of Columbia is the entire area you are looking at. Uh, my favorite place, this is the George Washington Bridge in the upper left corner. And my favorite spot is this little spot under the George Washington Bridge, um, which is a little red uh, lighthouse uh, where I used to spend most of my time studying. Uh, Dr. Barsley uh, has, well, Dr. Barsley, is your, if, why don't you turn your mic on and, and tell them what your role at, uh, at your school is. I'm at the LSU School of Dentistry in New Orleans, and uh, I am the division head for diagnostic sciences. sciences. I've been at the LSU for over 30 years now and doing forensics in, in New Orleans and the surrounding area of Louisiana for almost 35 years. Uh, and I think the next picture shows my school, if you want to show yes. them. Uh, this is our school before it flooded, but it looks pretty much the same as this now after the flood passed uh, nine years ago. So we're in, we're in good shape. Uh, and I, let, I wanted Adam to do this because he's a great speaker, and I have some prerogative as past president in making him do it. So. <laughs> And he's also a good friend, and I and I actually appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Barsley is also uh, the immediate past president, as you were told, of the AAFS, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. But he is also a past president of the American Board of Forensic Odontology, the board certifying agency uh, for forensic dentists. So what do you need to do to become a forensic dentist? Well, first thing you need to do 
is finish high school, which is typically four years. Uh, you need to go to college and get a four-year degree from college, typically something in the sciences, although not absolutely necessary. Uh, then you need to go to dental school, because to be a forensic dentist, you first need to be a dentist. And dental school is an additional four years. Uh, after dental school, some people will go on to dental specialties, uh, such as periodontists or endodontists, people that do gum surgery or root canals, um, and or uh, an oral surgeon. And oral surgery programs can be as long as six years where you earn your uh, medical degree, your MD, as well as your uh, specialty in oral maxillofacial surgery. Uh, and then you need to do continuing education in forensics because to typically dental schools, while they may give you some introductory courses in forensics, uh, that is not what they are teaching you. That is not their, their goal in teaching. They have plenty to do in those four years just to teach you how to be a dentist. Uh, so you have to then take ad hoc courses in forensic dentistry. Uh, there are some programs that are uh, more organized that are multiple years to do that. Uh, but the truth is that the continuing education portion in forensics is lifetime learning, uh, and there is not a, a day that goes by that I don't learn something about this from my colleagues. And then, of course, the highlight of my year coming up in February is going to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences meeting, where I, I spend a week learning uh, you know, from all the people that know a heck of a lot more than me. But what do forensic dentists do? Uh, well, one of the main stays of what we do is dental identifications. A body is found um, and they need to figure out who that person is uh, and forensic dentists do a lot of work in that. And that is something that I do literally every single week here in, in Connecticut. Uh, as a, we also do mass disaster work. Bob talked about uh, the floods at LSU uh, down there. We were all, many of us were deployed to Hurricane Katrina and at Hurricane Katrina uh, we did mass disaster identifications, uh, and there are teams, both local teams as well as uh, federal teams, that do this work. Uh, we do pattern injury analysis, or some people call them bite marks. We look at uh, bite marks in skin or in foodstuffs uh, and compare those to suspects uh, of potential crimes. We also do age estimation work. Um, in areas like Dr. Barsley's, he probably does a lot more with age estimation than I do here in Connecticut. Age estimation is very often done in conjunction with uh, INS uh, and people trying to enter this country uh, illegally uh, and trying to determine their age, but also we do age estimation in relationship to dental identifications. Child abuse cases, uh, lots of child abuse cases have bite marks involved in them and we uh, often look at child abuse cases or bite marks. And then we also do work in dental malpractice cases um, where somebody, a dentist is accused of, of having done something wrong dentally and uh, then there will be a forensic dentist very often on either side of that case. One thing to also note during this call is that Dr. Barsley is also an attorney and uh, used to be, I think up until recently, uh, a judge. So. Dr. Marsley has seen this on all on all sides of it. So, but why why dentistry? Why teeth um, for dental identifications? So, teeth are calcified structures. They're resistant to decomposing. They don't change uh, in water. They don't really dry out. They're resistant to cold and they're resistant to heat. So, you can see in the picture to your right that is a body found in the desert in San Antonio, and clearly no one's going to be doing a visual identification here. Uh, and while no one would even attempt that, you can see that the teeth are all there. Teeth do not change um, to most of these environments. And the very restorations, the very fillings that dentists uh, place are resistant to those same things. Um, and in fact, the dental restorations that we place are resistant to temperatures all the way up through cremation. And the reason for that is that they are encased in a protected environment very often. So even in a fire or trauma, uh, we have buccal fat pads, our cheeks. Um, some of us have, like me, fatter cheeks than others, but we have these, we have cheeks, we have a tongue, and the teeth are surrounded by the cheeks, the tongue, the lips, and the roots of the teeth are encased in bone. 
So even in cases of fire, very often teeth survive all the way through that. And here on the right, you can see, again, a body that was involved in a fire. And while you can see that the skin has been burnt, the ears are, for the most part, gone, uh, the lips have been pulled back because of the heat, the teeth themselves are all there and actually in, in quite good condition. Household fires typically run around 1,200 degrees. Cremation can be somewhere between 1,600 and 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. And teeth and bone uh, will last up to through 1,000 degrees. And again, the very restorations that we place, uh, crowns and fillings, uh, will last all the way up through 2,000 degrees. Uh, and very often, there have been cases, uh, a colleague of ours, Peter Loomis, did a case where a bridge was found in the desert. Uh, they couldn't understand why. Uh, the bridge was actually an upper and a lower bridge with a porcelain fused together. Uh, and it turns out that someone had uh, had dispersed the remains of a that were, of their loved one that was cremated, and the bridge was found still intact. So, again, teeth. Why teeth? There's lots of ways of identifying people. There's visual identifications. There's identifications using personal effects. If I'm found dead in my car, I have a driver's license on me. You can use exclusion. So if you have, uh, I worked on a case years ago. There's a private plane that crashed. Uh, there were two males and one female that we knew were on board. I was able to identify the female uh, very quickly because females have bumps in places that males don't have bumps. So I was able to figure out the female very quickly. Anthropologists get involved and they can, can help narrow the population down. Autopsy findings can be used. So very often during an autopsy there will be broken bones or other effects of disease or there will be bone plates or other items that we place in the body that have serial numbers on them. And those serial numbers uh, for joint replacements can be looked up and we can find out who the person is from autopsy findings. And then there's dental, and we're going to talk more about dental. There's fingerprints, and there's DNA. And these are listed from the least to most scientific, with actually only probably the bottom four being somewhat scientific. So surely if you have a bone or a joint replacement, um, autopsy findings in that serial number is very scientific. Uh, but the last four are scientific methods of identification. So visual identification is we notori are notoriously bad, and I think that there's nobody out there, including people like Dr. Barsley, who are way better than I am at this, that would do identifications visually on any of these, nor would they subject family members to the trauma of having to see their loved one in a state like that. And there have been articles after article where uh, visual identifications have gone wrong. So this is an article. Um, and this story was on 60 Minutes. Two girls are in a car crash. Um, one family is told that their daughter is dead. The other family is told that their daughter is alive, although in critical condition. They sit by her bedside for some five or so days, uh, only to realize that their daughter was the one that was dead, and they're actually sitting by the bedside of somebody else's daughter, the other families. And while these two girls uh, look similar, uh, they're both blonde, I would say, for the most part, that's where it stops. I mean, you have the girl on the left who has a pointier chin. You have a squarer chin. Their teeth actually don't look the same at all. Um, and there are quite, you know, obviously other differences, the shape of their face, um, even to some extent the color of their eyes. So visual identifications have gone wrong. They're still used, but they are fraught with problems, in my opinion. In dental, why is this scientific? Well, if we look at this in the most simplistic fashion, a tooth can either be missing or present. That's two potential possibilities. And there are also five surfaces of teeth that can be restored. There's the front surface, the top surface, the sides are your tongue, and two in-betweens. So that's just looking at it very simply. You can have seven possibilities. A tooth is either present or missing, and five surfaces that can be restored or virgin and you have 32 teeth. This is not taking into account things like uh, whether or not it's a gold filling or a silver filling, whether there's uh, whether or not there's uh, 
crowns on the teeth or root canals or other pathology. But just sort of simply put, if you look at the possible combinations of fillings to virgin teeth, they're astronomical, well beyond the population of the Earth, and that is why dental, is, dental identifications are scientific. This is just looking at a single case. Um, this is a skull that was found here in Connecticut. Um, we didn't know who that was. We sent that to the FBI. So this is doing a facial reconstruction. The FBI, using uh, methods, did a facial reconstruction in clay and determined this is what this person would look like. That picture was placed in a local newspaper uh, near where this body was found. And this woman's brother uh, said, you know, my sister went missing many, many years ago, and, and that photo, that reconstruction looks like her. Now, some would argue that they don't look anything alike, um, and I personally don't see the similarity. However, people, this works, and people very often will say, yes, that looks like my sister. However, this is not a scientific identification, and, and no medical examiner based on a brother saying that that looks like my sister is going to say, okay, we have an identification. Uh, they asked me to get involved, and these, what you're looking at, are the post-mortem x-rays I took, uh, or at least some of them. And the thing that stood out to me um, is really, this, this is, on the bottom what you're looking at is an anti-mortem, a before-death x-ray. And these are two anti-mortem, uh, post-mortem x-rays on the top. And I think you all can see my pointer, I hope. But there's this little what looks like a white chain right here under the roots of these two teeth. And on this one, on the other side, you can see there's a, a U-shaped pattern in the bone that starts, it's a white line that goes just like that. Well, when you look at the post, the anti-mortem x-ray down here, you can see the same chain right along the bottom of these teeth right here, same as that, and you can see that same U-shaped pattern in the bone here. So what I did is just did a overlay, essentially, of those two images, and we were able to make an identification, not even really from the teeth, but really the trabecular pattern uh, that was in the bone. So Dr. Barsley is going to talk a little bit about aging, but I want to give you just a little sense of aging here. So this is Dr. Barsley's picture in the, that he has in the ABFO's uh, manual years ago. And there he is a few years later. And very much what he looks like right now. I believe that's a picture of you at the Academy meeting. Um, this is you, Dr. Barsley. Uh, I'll let you tell you. You're going to have to hit the space bar occasionally, but this is a okay, case that... Tell me where you want to go. No, this is, this is a case that we were privileged to do several years ago in concert with the FBI, and it's an, it's an aging case. Uh, it's also a facial reconstruction case. Uh, and what, it, what I hope to highlight using this case is the fact that oftentimes dentistry works in concert with, with many other people, anthropologists uh, for uh, facial reconstruction and you know law enforcement, of course, in every case. And this was a poor young child whose body was found in a Midwestern city uh, and, and found in this decomposed state. Um, when they canvassed the neighborhood to see if it was missing, nobody, you know, t said that my child's missing or anybody I know is missing. And the child's skull that you see here was was taken to be aged around five and a half to six years old. And the case lay fallow for several years. And eventually the FBI got involved, and they brought it down to Louisiana, where I work with a, a group of anthropologists at the Faces Laboratory uh, in LSU that work with missing and exploited children. And they asked us to get involved. So we did two things, and you can hit the button now, Adam. We first of all X-ray the uh, the skull to, to see what the, the teeth look like uh, on the x-ray and you can hit it again which is not easy to do because uh, the x-ray machine wasn't built to do a skull but this is the best x-ray we could get out and you can see that this child uh, t to a dentist can tell you that uh, uh, an Adam can point with this pointer out and mine will work on this that you know her six-year molars are just developing uh, her baby teeth are all still in place she has 20 baby teeth and you can see her lowers and her uppers uh, she doesn't has not really begun to form some teeth that uh, may never grow. Uh, her 12-year molar sockets are present, but the tooth buds have, have fallen out. Um, 
And so we, there, there are tables we can look at, and we can compare that those of you who have children know that your children lose their teeth. They're born without teeth. They get their first teeth this six months or seven months or eight months. Uh, they have a full set of teeth by the time they're two and a half. And sometime around the age of six years old, they begin to lose their baby teeth uh, with their lower front teeth going first and their upper front teeth going second and then progressing. And this is constant across all races, all genders, uh, across the world, in fact, uh, with you know, some differences for, for uh, location and nutrition and things like that. But in general, we have a rough idea. But if you look at this case, uh, we looked at it with several other dentists, and we determined this child was about three and a half years old at the time of death, uh, not five and a half. So hit the button again, Adam, please, sir. Uh, the facial reconstructionists at LSU made the same facial reconstruction uh, like Adam showed and then took this picture and put it in the newspaper in the area where the body was found and said that this was a child missing for five years now, and at the time she went missing, she was about three and a half years old. And someone recognized, not, not the, as Adam just said, didn't recognize this as a particular person, but said, you know, I had a little cousin who was living here with uh, her family, and uh, she disappeared around that time. And she was three and a half years old, and when I asked, they said she had moved. Uh, uh, another uncle had come taking her to somewhere else. And as it turns out, then able to do DNA and find out that, yes, this was the missing child, uh, that had been murdered and dumped in the uh, garbage can, and you know, the case was laid to rest. So the cooperation uh, part is important, and the aging part allowed the dentistry uh, group to contribute quite handily to this case. Uh, I thought it was an interesting case for people to see. Uh, I think and I agree. And I agree. I mean, these are these are the types of cases that make this job worth doing, because it really brings rest to a family, and and uh, you know, they 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 be they have the ability to put a period at the end of that sentence and, and start moving on. Uh, otherwise, they're constantly looking for their child or their loved one. Did you want to? Yeah, and this is just another just a, just an example I use with dentists all the time. This uh, Again, Adam can use this pointer and going from the left to the right. You have a third molar, you have a second molar, and you have a first molar in an x-ray. And just to show that the, the teeth mature at different rates. And we're able to give a rough idea of the age. And that tooth that he's pointing at right now is not broken. That's just an incompletely formed tooth. So, again, we have tables that let us know uh, a, a, that a person whose tooth has, a person whose third molar has formed to this degree, you know, is about 16 years. I don't, I don't have a table in front of me, so I can't tell you exactly. But it's someone age area of 16 years old. Now, this is important in a lot of areas, particularly. Uh, as Adam mentioned earlier, in the uh, immigration area where people come into this country and are detained by the immigration service, uh, and it depends on whether they're adults or children. Uh, and one of the indicators used to determine if someone is over 18 or under 18 is the state of their dentition, whether they have a dentition of an 18-year-old or a dentition of a 17-year-old. It's also important in Europe. Europe has even more laws than I mean, we had the concern about aging, and they have uh, points at 14 and 16 years old where uh, it's important to determine if a person is 14 years old or 16 years old or 18 years old. So again, this is just an idea to show that the teeth you know, grow from a certain area in the bone and that they, uh, you know, that your wisdom teeth finish last. Uh, and you know, just not a just an interesting case, uh, no particular import of a particular case, but just the idea. Yeah. So we also talked about the fact that uh, forensic dentists work in, in uh, mass disasters, and, and one of the ma last major mass disasters in the United States that a lot of people, that's not what I want to do, uh, a lot of people were involved in is Hurricane Katrina. And as you can see, Hurricane Katrina is right now forming over uh, right on the Atlantic side of Florida. It's not that big of a storm as it comes over Florida. But as you see, as soon as it hits the warm waters of the Gulf, that storm, as you can see now, is expanding. Uh, it actually contracts here a little bit. And then as it turns up right toward Dr. Barsley's home, uh, you can see that the storm really expands. And you'll see the eye, which just popped up a little bit over here. You'll see it even more so. Right now, that storm is about the size of Texas. But you can see right there the eye. This is where the storm is at its strongest. And it comes right up and uh, makes landfall right in the New Orleans area. It actually comes right over, the eye comes right over Gulfport. Uh, and the storm actually slows down right before it gets to Gulfport. But New Orleans takes uh, a major hit. This is the first time uh, the federal government and our DMAR team 
deploy two portable morgues. They deploy one on the east side of the Mississippi and one on the west side of the Mississippi. The original one set in Baton Rouge um, on the west side, and on the east side we were put in Gulfport. Um, I would tell you that they did a way better job on the uh, west side because they put themselves slightly outside of the disaster area, and we were literally right in the disaster area. Dr. Barsley uh, was in charge of the dental team in uh, the Gulfport morgue, and I was the post-mortem chief uh, in the in the Gulfport area, uh, he was in Baton Rouge. If I said Gulfport, I apologize for that. So after the storm, uh, every structure is searched, and you're looking at a USAR symbol, this symbol, which tells you the date this structure was searched, what they found. One person was dead, and they found that person on 914. They also tell you whether or not who, what team looked at it. Um, and these symbols were literally on everything that was left over, every car, every uh, house, every garage, everything was searched. Uh, this is a picture from Dr. Barsley's area um, in the New Orleans area, and you can see here uh, a couple of terrifying things. First, you can see the water line right there. That's how high the water got in this house. Uh, this is all good old New Orleans mud throughout the house. But the most terrifying thing in these pictures is always when you see the attic open. Um, when the attic is, attic is opened like that, uh, you're in for trouble because what that means is this family uh, should get out of this water, went up into the attic. Well, uh, I've been in Dr. Barsley's area, in the New Orleans area, and I was in Gulfport for two weeks. It was hot as blazes, and I'm sure you've all been in your attics uh, in the summer. And uh, in the summer in the south, attics get really hot, and there's no water and no food up there. And very often the result was this, a team going in and carrying out a body bag. Um, and then all of those people were brought to these two central morgues, as I said, e -Mort East and e -Mort West. Um, and you can see the kind of damage that uh, the storm did. And, and uh, one of the major problems we had at Hurricane Katrina is not only were homes destroyed and a lot of people died, but all of the dental offices were also uh, destroyed. Uh, and those anti-mortem records, which are so important to making dental identifications, were also underwater. Um, this is the condition of some of them. Uh, these were supplied to me by Dr. Barsley uh, from from his side. Uh, these are some from, from my side uh, in the Gulfport region. And what you can see here is these x-rays were wet and stuck between paper. And the emulsion of the x-rays is actually sitting here on the paper. They're no longer on the films themselves. And so where we were actually looking is here on the paper, no longer looking at the x-rays, but thinking sort of outside the box and looking at these uh, these pieces of paper to look at. And you can see the restorations even in this picture. I mean, you can see these white amalgam restorations here and here. And that's where we were making the, some of these IDs from. Adam, can, can you back up before we go to my marks uh, about three slides to the attic door? That one? No, one more. One more, one more still. This is such an interesting case. I wanted, if you don't mind, spend about thirty seconds okay. more on this. This this case is sad in many ways. This picture was taken in April of two thousand and six, after the morgues had closed. Right? And the gentleman that died in this house uh, actually was caught on the attic stairs. He was a very older, an elderly gentleman. He was walking up to the stairs to his safety spot in the, in the attic, and his foot got caught between the back of the step in the attic door and he fell over backwards either drowned or expired from being hanging upside down uh, we never did find out unable to identify this person even though we knew what house he was from and he had left a note in his pocket telling us who he was and all those kind of things but scientifically we could never find any kind of antecedent we could not find dental records we could not find DNA we could not find fingerprints to compare him to so he remains technically unidentified even though we know who he is uh, all these cases were sad like that. And the other sad thing about going into your attic was uh, there's no way out. 
uh, unless you bring an axe or a chainsaw. Uh, and as the storm moved on the next day when helicopters were coming to rescue people, if you texted your uh, location to the Coast Guard or somebody, they would send a helicopter out to your house and they would tap on the ceiling on the roof. And if you didn't answer within 30 seconds, they didn't cut a hole look for you. They just moved on to the next house because they didn't have time to look. So I just thought that was a very poignant story about Katrina. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. I, that, I think that's interesting. I didn't even know that about the slide. Uh, this is also one of Dr. Barsley's slides, again, asking for those x rays. We went over this slide. Why am I not moving? There we go. Well, yeah, you skipped. Oh, there you go. We're back at bite marks. So bite marks um, are something that you see very often on TV. Uh, one of the problems I have is this is hopefully bite mark CSI style. Got to know for your bedside manner, are you there, Doc? Here's Tony. The program uses laser scans of 3D objects to create 3D images for comparison. Computer generator hollow volume overlay measures the inner two. Here's Ducky's muscle. Do it, Abby. So, as I told you, Dr. Barsley has been doing this a lot longer than me. and. Uh, is a lot better than me, and that may be the way he does cases, uh, 30 seconds to figure out who made the bite mark, uh, but that technology does not exist. One of the problems I have is that policemen and detectives watch CSI and very often believe that that technology exists, and they'll have me come and look at a bite mark and then ask me immediately, well, who did it? Um, and, and that is weeks of work, not, uh, not 30 seconds worth of work. But bite marks look something like that. Um, that's a bite mark in skin. Uh, I can look at this and tell you that this is surely the upper arch, and this is the lower arch. Bite marks typically are oval in shape, very often have a central area that's red, a, a central contusion. And the reason that they're oval in shape is that they are made by two opposing uh, arches that uh, leave these indentations. So you're looking at bruises here made from individual teeth. And this is taken, by the way, with a ruler that you'll see very often throughout forensics. That's called an ABFO number two ruler. So I can look at that bite mark, and I'm sure Dr. Barsley can look at that bite mark and tell you which teeth made each individual mark. And then we can make hollow volume overlays from suspects and compare them to that mark. Now, bite marks are not like DNA. You cannot say this is the only person in the world that made this mark. Uh, in the older days, that is something that was said, but uh, I think today not many of us in, a, in an open population in the United States would say this is the biter. Having said that, uh, you can surely include and exclude people and, and create some level of probability uh, of who may have made that mark. So we talked a little bit about bite marks. Is the question is, is that a bite mark? And the answer is it is a bite mark. It's not a human bite mark. Um, it, you can see that there's this V-shaped mark on this breast right here. But the reason that it's not a human bite mark is humans aren't the only thing that bite. And in fact, animals bite far more often uh, than humans bite. Uh, in fact, in, I think, 1983 was a statistic I could find in uh, emergency rooms in New York. They saw something like 15,000 New York City bite marks. Uh, only about 10% of those were human bite marks. The others were, were dog bites. Um, but dogs and humans have different number of teeth. Dogs have six lower incisors between their canines, where we have four. And you can see here the dentition here of a cat, here of a dog, and of a horse. Horses actually often uh, have bite marks that look very similar to human bite marks. But obviously, you can see, again, there's six lower incisors. There's canines. And there are forensic dentists uh, that do work that is pretty much uh, solely in, in animal bites. So 
and here are those statistics. So in New York City in 1982, and while those are old statistics because I can't find them again, uh, they saw almost 15,000 bites. Of those, only 10% of them approximately were human. The vast majority were dogs, all the way down to sea lions, beavers, guinea pigs, and chipmunks, um, and monkeys. There are lots of text, textbooks on forensic dentistry. Uh, the one on the left is, is no longer in print, but is a, one of the earlier editions. Uh, the Manual of Forensic Odontology, uh, the book you see to the right, is sponsored by the American Society of Forensic Odontology, and we are on a new edition. Uh, Forensic Dentistry, the second edition by Senan Stimson, uh, two colleagues of ours, Dental Autopsy, by Dr. Silver and Suveron out of Miami. And this is the most current edition, uh, a great book, uh, probably the most comprehensive single text in Forensic Odontology, the Manual of Forensic Odontology by CRC Press, uh, and where it was edited by Dr. Sen and Weems. There are several books on bite marks. Um, this is actually a first and second edition of Bite Mark Evidence, which is I think actually maybe the only book just on bite marks uh, by Dr. Dorian and, uh, from Montreal. There are a lot, people often ask, what organizations can we join to become part of this? Well, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences is without question the most satisfying professional organization that I belong to. It is a full of a group of people who literally, literally are there to help. Uh, and there's not a single person that I've walked up to uh, at one of these meetings and asked a question from the president of the organization all the way down to a new person or to some legend uh, in, the, in the field and ask questions that weren't willing to sit and talk to me. There's the American Society of Forensic Odontology, which is open to all. You do not even have to be a dentist to belong. Um, and it is a great organization. Uh, and as I said, uh, they have a uh, a meeting the Tuesday of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences meeting. The AAFS uh, has a meeting every February, February, and anybody that's even casually interested in this topic or in forensics should absolutely go to that meeting. And there's also the ABFO, the American Board of Forensic Odontology. That is the board certifying agency for forensic dentists. And there's sort of, and those are completely out of order, those little but these three organizations uh, can be seen sort of like this. The ABFO is the board certifying agency. You need to take a test. You need to prove that you are competent to belong. Um, and that's their only job is to basically vet whether or not you are competent as a forensic dentist. The American Academy of Forensic Sciences has several different uh, levels. You can enter as a trainee affiliate move up to an associate member, then a member, and a fellow. Um, and while there's no test, there are certain things that you have to do to get from one to the other, which varies from different, from each individual uh, organization within there. So toxicology may have a different set of standards to move up the chain uh, than the odontology section, as I, we already talked about the ASFO. And literally, you could be a student that joins this, a lawyer that joins this, Somebody that's just casually interested in forensic and ontology uh, can join. So one thing I would say about forensic dentistry as a whole as we come to the end and open this up to questions is that, and this by the way is Rodin's Thinker, which is right outside the philosophy building at Columbia University. Um, you have to learn to think outside the box. Uh, very often uh, we're in dentistry, we're taught really to think inside the box. You do things a certain way. Um, but forensics is really thinking outside the box. You have to remember that everything changes, um, some for the good and some for the bad. Very often in cases there's confusion, um, but you have to sometimes look for the simplest solution, not the most complex solution. And if you work hard and put your back to it, anything at all is possible, uh, and you can make great friends like Dr. Barsley is of mine. And I would open this up to any questions and or color commentary about anything I missed from Dr. Barsley. Bob, you there? Sorry, I was I was asked which one was I on that picture. Huh? 
Which one were you in this picture? <laughs> yeah. No, the other one. The the way of the, the cow and the dolphin. Huh? Uh, I, I I want to go with I want to be the dolphin. <laughs> I knew you would. The, the only thing I wanted to add to this has been an outstanding talk uh, is that for all three of those organizations, ABFO, the ASFO, and the AAFS, all meet in Seattle. They always meet in February. They meet around the country. They go from region to region. If you have a serious interest in, in forensic dentistry or forensic anything, uh, attendance at that meeting is a must. It is the the one time of the year that you know two or three thousand, as as, as uh, Dr. Logan said, you know up to four thousand people meet together, go over their casework, present new theories, present new papers, uh, you know, and you, you you just it's the only way to keep up with the with the field is to attend those meetings. Uh, so I want I want to plug that meeting this year. It's in uh, uh, Seattle in February. It's almost always during President's Week, and as I say, it moves around the country. Next year, I think it's in Orlando, and the following year, it's back in Vegas, and it's in New Orleans, and I think back to Seattle. So, you know, our website covers that, and you can certainly look it up on that. That's all I had to say. And I totally agree with you, Bob. I find that the, the I look forward more to the Academy meeting than anything else. Uh, it is truly a labor of love. I absolutely. Uh, would recommend anybody that has an interest in this to go at least once. And the camaraderie that you will see is exactly the way all sciences should be. Um, I would absolutely recommend that anybody that's on this call uh, attend. So, Jeff, how do people go about asking questions? Uh, so I have a few questions here uh, that I'll start with. But if you are have something that you're curious about, there's a chat box there. Uh, just go ahead and type in your question, and we'll uh, read it out here and get some answers. So the uh, first one is, uh, do I understand correctly that there isn't a degree for forensic odontology? Um, that's not completely true. There isn't a degree that's given in the United States for forensic odontology. Um, there is no master's in forensic odontology or PhD in the United States. However, there are other countries that do give out uh, PhDs and masters for forensic odontology. Um, forensic odontology, it's sort of a catch-22, is not a recognized specialty by the American Dental Association. Having said that, there's lots of things that are not recognized specialties, including cosmetic dentistry by the American Dental Association. Many schools have sort of said, well, if you're not recognized by the American Dental Association, we can't have a master's program. And on the other hand, if you can't you can't be recognized unless you have a master's program. So it's a bit of a catch-22. Uh, there is a uh, there is a fellowship that's given in San Antonio at the University of Texas, uh, which is a two-year program uh, that you go once every about five or six weeks for a long weekend uh, that covers all aspects of forensic odontology. It's an amazing program, uh, but you do not get a degree. You get a certificate at the end. Dr. Barsley, you want to? You probably. No, I, I, as Adam said, in Europe there are several universities that offer the degree. Uh, there are a couple people that have PhDs and a number of masters, and I believe McGill uh, in Canada, uh, Dr. Dorian's uh, university offers some type of uh, advanced training. I'm not sure what the degree that attaches to that is or not. So, uh, if you speak French, you can go to Montreal. Well, I think we'd all enjoy that. <laughs> Um, so, are there nationally recognized standards uh, for forensic odontology? Yeah, I'm gonna take that one uh, because the, the, the American Board of Forensic Odontology does publish uh, guidelines and standards, uh, and there's a different a guideline that's suggested. Standard is an absolute. Uh, so, the, the board over the 30 years of existence has, you know, published uh, uh, and revised uh, those standards. Uh, there's a swig of scientific working group. Who is currently in the process of putting together best practices uh, for all types of forensic uh, endeavors, but certainly a best practice guide for uh, disaster identification and victim identification uh, using dentistry. So those guides and standards are out there. Uh, and also but, Interpol, Interpol also for for identifications and mass disaster work, uh, they also produce uh, a best practices. Um, so there's absolutely best practices. You could go on the ABFO website which is abfo.org, and if you look up our rep, the, the Diplomates Reference Manual, uh, which is on, on the website, uh, you will see the standards and, and uh, best practices for 
bite marks, uh, identifications, age estimation, and mass disaster work. Um, so this one comes back and then it says, uh, do you recommend taking some law courses? And I think that's because you were, uh, mentioned that you were a lawyer, Bob. But I would like uh, to open that to be a little bit broader, if that's okay, is do you, what what type of courses for an undergraduate do you recommend? Are there uh, specialty courses that they should take or uh, things that they should be focusing on and thinking about? Adam, you want to talk? You were not even, I have an idea, but I'll let you go first if you. Sure. I mean, I, first, I think that, I, I mean, well, well, there's you deal with a lot of law in this, in this field because forensic dentistry is the application of dentistry to the law. Uh, so I don't think it's a bad thing to take law courses. I think it's a good thing. And, and if I were younger, I probably would do what Dr. Barsley did and, and go to law school too, just because I think it's interesting. I think a lot of people, uh, as far as getting interested in terms of coursework, will very often start out with a one-day course. Uh, they are given all over the United States. Uh, you know, I give one up in Mohegan Sun coming up soon. At any dental conference, there's the Yankee Dental Conferences coming up. They give courses at the Amer at the ADA meeting. I'm sure there were courses in forensic dentistry, and very often those are half day or one day courses. Um, and then people get an interest, and from there you can take a several day course. And uh, those are very odd. There's one given at Detroit Mercy uh, that's very hands on. Uh, and then you can go and take a one week course, uh, week long courses. For instance, there's the Southwest Symposium that's given every other year where we bring you in the morgue, we, uh, you watch an autopsy, we, we make you do identifications on bodies, we bring in skulls and have you do identifications, we have you do age estimations, we have you do forensic photography, we have you work on bite marks, um, we do a mass disaster. So there are courses for all levels, uh, but I surely would recommend uh, taking one of those. You don't have to be a dentist to take typically a one-day course, uh, but if you are a dentist, and I don't know what the audience is, I'm sure there's a bit of everything, uh, I would say take, go ahead and take those courses. If you're an undergrad in dental school, tell your dental school that you want a course in forensic dentistry, um, and they can contact the ABFO, and we can surely find a speaker in your area to come and give a course. Dr. Barsley? No, I echo what Adam said, and, and as far as being a lawyer, uh, I became interested in law through forensics. Um, uh, I don't. I, I, I can practice law. I don't practice law. Like any other thing, you can only be good at one thing at a time. And so, uh, the lawyers have their skills, and uh, you know, we we let the lawyers do the lawyer things, and the dentists do the dentist things. And trying to be both uh, usually ends up in trouble. I can think of a few good examples of that. You know. So we won't go into that here. Having said that, I would also tell you, you will learn a lot of law. You are not going to be a lawyer, but you will learn a lot of law when you get involved in forensics. Uh, are there any summer courses or classes for teenagers? Actually, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences has a student academy every February uh, as part of their program. The Student Academy is, uh, I know Dr. Barsley is a, was a faculty member of it. I continue to be a faculty member. It is an amazing one-day uh, course in all aspects of, forensic dentist, of forensics. They bring in uh, a specialist from all the different sections at the academy, and you go in small groups from section to section. Uh, Dr. Barsley's daughter took it several years ago, um, and so that is a terrific program. Uh, and again, the academy meeting moves around the United States. Uh, as Dr. Barsley mentioned, it's in Seattle this year, then Orlando next year. So you can get involved there. Uh, that is a, a phenomenal, phenomenal program. Uh, Dr. Logan or Dr. Barsley may know more than I about how you actually uh, take that program uh, or get involved in that in the student academy. Do you know more about Dr. Barsley? Yeah, I, I, a little bit. I would say that you know we don't offer courses specifically to high school people. A lot of the subject matter is, um, uh, let's say, very mature. Uh, so there's a difficulty in, in crafting the course to offer to high schools. What the academy does do, uh, in addition to the student academy, which is offered at the annual meeting every year, the academy 
three or four times a year does what we call a forensic science educators conference and we will at the request of local colleges or local school organizations we will put on a three or four day course for science teachers high school and uh, science teachers to let them use forensics to help teach science to students in their class so a, a group of forensic uh, group people from the academy will actually put this class on for the science teachers to help them understand how they can use forensics uh, to entice and interest the class and of course any any school I've lectured at numbers of high schools people will ask you to lecture but again you have to craft that lecture but it's uh, um, but we don't focus uh, the, AA, the AAFS is focused on baccalaureate degree and higher individuals so. although okay. I would say that if if you're in a high school where there's a group of interested people again uh, that want to hear about forensic dentistry you can contact the ABFO by going on on our website into the contact us section uh, and request a speaker and, and actually that email will come to me I am currently the secretary of the ABFO and we would surely try to find somebody locally that would be willing to come and craft a lecture that would be age appropriate uh, to, to your organization or to your school this one came in and I think you guys kind of answer it uh, this came in early in the session is uh, what are what's some of the best way to get connected with forensic taught ontologists well I, I mean I'll start I'm sure dr. Bursley has a longer history with this mentorship is huge in the field of forensics uh, as it is in all sciences um, and so my suggestion it would be if you're if you're a dentist uh, or even maybe an undergrad thinking of going to dental school uh, if you go on the ASFO website I think you might have to be a member uh, or you can contact the ABFO you can ask for who in that your area is around and and we are used to mentoring people that is what we do I, I had a conversation with Dr. Barsley the other day uh, thanking him for his mentorship. Um, it is an amazing group of people um, that truly are are there to help you out. So I would say contact somebody local and uh, ask to shadow them. Um, and I would say that most of them are pretty willing to do that. And then the second step is after you have some forensic uh, uh, stuff under your belt, then you need to, to contact the local law enforcement of uh, local DAs local coroners or, or medical examiners uh, because not every medical examiner has a, a forensic dentist working with them I mean you have 3,000 and something counties in the country not all of them have an associated and then the whole group of the ABFO has less than 100 people certified ASFO has about 600 members I think at the present time the section of the Academy has about 500 uh, members give or take so I mean there's certainly uh, certainly still a field where where new people have a chance to get in and, and, and do some work. I agree. And, that, and that's how, I mean, you start slow and you build up. You know, when I first, when I first started, you know, I, I sat around and did a whole lot of nothing until, uh, you know, you got a little bit of experience under your belt and you get your first case. And, and all of a sudden, before you know it, you've got more work to do than, than time allows or that your wife will allow you to do. And you'll never get rich doing this. That's the one thing you got to remember. This is not a money-making proposition, basically. So. You will spend more money than you will make in forensic dentistry, but you will enjoy yourself and make friendships that last an absolute lifetime. That's true. Okay. Um, is there one case that uh, particularly stands out in your career that you'd like to share, or uh, what was maybe your first case? I can talk about. My first case uh, occurred to somebody that left dental school, and uh, it's a case that the that, that ID was solved very easily. It was a, a, a car that exploded, and the body was burned by recognition, and the coroner had no idea what to do. And so he called me and asked if I could look at the body and you know, possibly compare dental records from life to the, the records I would see uh, from uh, at death. And uh, that was the ID itself was simple. I don't think that the police or the coroner ever explained how the car exploded uh, you know so it sticks with me and that's so simple and hard at the same time uh, and then 
on other cases that stick with me, of course, was the Katrina cases. Uh, our morgue, the morgue in Baton Rouge, uh, handled oh, almost 900 and I think 950, 855 cases uh, of death, uh, which was certainly not all the cases in the in the hurricane, uh, along with some thousand displaced caskets, uh, caskets that have been washed up by the water, and you know we have to try to repatriate those caskets to the correct grave. A very difficult uh, task. So those those two things stick with me. And I would say for me, um, I would agree with Dr. Barsley. Doc, Hurricane Katrina uh, was probably the most memorable of of my career, um, and I think that mostly because the the conditions were so austere that it really drove the group of people that were together uh, to be very tight knit. Um, you know, on on our side, we were living in the back end of uh, eighteen wheelers. We had no beds. There's no food other than MREs, uh, no air conditioning, no showers for the first many days working in a morgue. Uh, it was hot as blazes. Uh, I was told by several of the people down in the south uh, about being a northerner coming down to the south and how I would not be uh, make it more than a couple of days. Um, and I think that, the, again, it's the camaraderie for me that, uh, that was striking them. The work was the work. I mean, that was, you know, it was challenging and there was a lot of it. But I think the more austere the conditions, the closer knit the group will be. I'm coming on one other case, too, if you don't mind. The first pipe bar case I ever looked at was, uh, and something you have to understand when you get into this, um, you, know, you know more than the people who are asking you uh, about the case, but you don't know everything about this. You know, this is a lot of this is on the job training. Um, this is continual. We know much more today than we knew 30 years ago. And individually, I know much more uh, than I knew 30 years ago. And certainly at the end of the meeting in February, I'll know more than I know today. But to go back to my original point, uh, we had a, a rather horrific murder in New Orleans. Uh, and the coroner was at the time convinced that the uh, killer was a particular person who had bitten the victim. And uh, he was most disappointed when I looked at the wounds and determined, in my estimation, and that there were not bite marks. And there's a lot of pressure sometimes to, to conform and to... You know, the doc, you got to help us out. You, know, you can't help them out. I mean, you have to. You have to follow the truth. Uh, you're not helping anybody out here. You're you're looking for the truth, and your opinion or your report uh, uh, is the truth as you see it. Uh, it's not designed to help or hinder. It's just designed to forward the investigation. Uh, and since that case, I still have that case in my files, and I still show it to people, and they all agree with me that it wasn't a bite mark. Uh, so I'm glad that I resisted the temptation to call it a bite mark. So, so and for me, a singular case, I mean, I think the one that I'm working on currently, uh, you know, the one that comes to mind on a bite mark case, uh, which is just the case of a, uh, a young girl who just turned three years old who was left with mommy's boyfriend, um, and mommy's boyfriend uh, raped her and then swung her around in the basement by her feet until her head hit a lolly column, a cement column, uh, which killed her. Um, and so... Uh, the nice thing is, is there were bite marks, uh, unlike the one that Dr. Barsley had, where he said there were not bite marks. And I was able to recover both salivary amylase and DNA off of the bite mark, and uh, that case will eventually go to court. But uh, it's most memorable just because I was working on it two days ago. Yeah. Um, so dealing with the fact that this is such a gruesome topic sometimes, uh, is there any advice that you could offer to someone just coming into the field of how to deal with uh, that nature of material? I, I would say two things. So we recognize that it's that it can be disturbing. I, I would say that anyone that works in death investigation uh, over time has to detach themselves from uh, from from the victim and from the injuries and from what you see in a certain fashion. You you, you if you get too emotionally involved. You're going to have troubles on your own side, but you also can't pursue the, the case correctly. But then you have to also recognize that everyone is affected by this. And uh, our best practices today uh, re require that uh, mental health be uh, looked into, that, uh, that, that people who, particularly in Katrina, we had to speak with a counselor you know, once a week. We had to be debriefed because it really is too much to internalize. Uh, so it is, it, and, and not everybody can do this. Uh, one of my, one of my, 
very best friends who just passed away and was a very well thought of forensic odontologist who led the led the identification of both uh, the Guyana Jonestown massacre, uh, the KLM plane crash uh, on, on the Canary Islands, uh, and identified hundreds of people. When he finished those cases, he said, "That's it. I'm not doing this again." This is, this is more than I can handle, you know. And 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 in the ensuing 20 years in forensic, uh, in, in excuse me, in pathology, he didn't he didn't take up any more forensic cases because he knew he'd reached his limit. So I think you have to recognize that. Dan, I w I would agree. I mean, I, I think part of it is taking it slow. Uh, you know, going in and uh, witnessing autopsies. Surely, when you take anatomy, it's very similar to that. Uh, but I think what Dr. Barsley, I'd echo what Dr. Barsley said, which is that anybody that does this, that says that they're not affected by it, is wrong. And some of the things that you see are absolutely gruesome. And in fact, as I sit here today, um, I am sitting probably three and a half miles from the Newtown School um, and, the, and the site of that disaster uh, or mass murder. Uh, and any, anybody and everybody that I know that has, saw what went on there uh, is affected by it. We just celebrated its year anniversary uh, a few days ago, and uh, anybody that was there that tells you that they weren't affected uh, is lying to you. So these are things that are gruesome at times, uh, but I will tell you that some of the biggest hugs that I've gotten, some of the nicest cards that I've gotten, are from family members who who you buy, I've either helped, whether it be an identification or in bite mark cases. Great. So I got one more question here. Uh, if you guys have any other uh, questions, please feel free to submit them right now. Um, but the last one I got is, where do you see the future of forensic odontology going? That's interesting. I think that that's, that's wasn't uh, the theme of your meeting something about the future, Dr. Barsley, last year? No, I think the theme was the, the, the education, research, and uh, uh, practice and experience, I think, was my theme. Uh, I, I certainly anyone who's who's watched forensic odontology over the last couple of years realizes that that there have been a number of, of poorly done bite mark cases in the past, and I think that uh, the, the board and, and those who practice forensic odontology recognize that and have adopted new uh, guidelines and standards that uh, hopefully will prevent uh, uh, similar cases in the future. Uh, although, like any identification science uh, or, or the opinion given by a pathologist, the opinion given by an anthropologist, the opinion given by a psychiatrist, you know, it is an opinion. And it's based in science. It's based on, on hard evidence, uh, but it's based on uh, practitioners' interpretation of that evidence. Uh, it, it's not quantifiable. Uh, it's not calculable, uh, certainly in the bite mark area. Even in the identification field, it's, uh, you know, even though it's, it's always going to be an opinion. So I think we have to be careful that we recognize this opinion. We have to be careful that the lawyers and the law enforcement people that deal with us recognize it is an opinion uh, and it therefore has some limitations. Uh, but we constantly strive to uh, point out any shortcomings uh, and, then, and to the extent possible correct those shortcomings uh, through research. I think you're going to see some, uh, some wonderful research on bite marks come out in the next six months that was sponsored by the uh, National Institute of Justice, uh, which I think will help put bite marks on a firmer footing as to, you know, can we link patterns uh, back to the objects that made the patterns? So again, it's just constant moving forward. That's that's what I see. I would agree. I think, you know, I think that uh, probably some new digital technology will be incorporated on how we do that digital impressions uh, as it relates to then using, you know, as it relates to doing bite marks. Uh, things like that, because those th those digital files are sitting out there, uh, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, so, I mean, I think I agree with Dr. Barsley. There's always research. Like any science, things are moving forward, um, and I, I think that uh, the ABFO and forensic odontology and our odontology section will be around for a very long time. And I, let me add one more thing. I think that you know, it, it, the science is not any easier or simpler, but the techniques are, are certainly some digital radiography has made identification so much faster. I can get an x-ray or I can have someone take an x-ray. I can see an x-ray uh, within seconds. I can determine if it's a good x-ray or need another x-ray. I can get the comparison materials through the web or digitally within seconds and, and make an identification 
uh, in a relatively short period of time as compared to what used to take hours or days can now be done in the span of you know minutes or tens of minutes, uh, which I think is uh, a, a nice step forward. Great. Um, well, it looks like we've wrapped up with all the questions. Uh, no more have been submitted. Uh, if there's anything that you guys would like to say as a closing remark, uh, that would be the time. I would just like to thank Dr. Barsley and Dr. Logan for inviting us to do this. Uh, all of you who have attended and given up an hour of your evening, uh, thank you very much. Um, you can find our, um, our probably our emails. If you have any questions, uh, can we give those out or not? If you would like to, you're welcome to. Sure. Uh, for me, if you'd like to contact me, you can get me at a freeman f r e e m a n at abfo.org. Um, and uh, to everybody that's out there that's again spent their hour with us, uh, have happy holidays and happy new year. I'd like to echo what Adam said. I'd like to thank Adam. I'd like to thank Barry. I'd like to thank the Academy and Jeff for helping us put this on. Uh, again, I think the takeaway message is that we're willing to help you, and you can reach me through the same email as Adam, except mine is R B A R S L E Y at abfo.org. So, again, happy holidays and thank you for your time. Great. I want to thank everyone uh, as well for coming out uh, and letting you know that if you uh, uh, would like to watch this webinar again, it will be archived on the Academy's website at afs.org slash webinars uh, and feel free to pass that on to anybody you think uh, might enjoy this. Uh, thanks again for the time. Thank you, Bob and Adam. Uh, it has been a great pleasure being here with you tonight and it was certainly a lot to be gained. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good, good evening. Night. Good night. Good night.